Hey, everybody. That was a pretty hard intro there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff, man. <laughs> Welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, tonight, we have Shane Sensum on. We're, uh, we're going to talk about some deer tracking and all kinds of other stuff, probably. Um, Shane, I've been watching you on YouTube for a long time now, like years. Um, Thank you. And it, it's kind of crazy how... Uh, how much you've grown you your channel is fairly large now i mean in the grand scheme of things so um there's a reason for that you make good quality content appreciate it yeah um i don't you guys know what have, it's up to yet but i think it's in the 40s yeah like that. yep youtube's a grind man and that's what like the the people that uh are successful at it that's what they do they just grind and they just keep going for years and years and years and then all of a sudden it's like oh i got i've accumulated all these uh followers you know yeah i'll tell you it, it is definitely a grind especially when you're out of state hunting you know many out you're up many hours a day and so there were some days i was like man just forget this camera stuff <laughs> yeah but, I, yep but yep. at the end of the day i enjoy going back and looking at you know, some of the footage myself for yeah. personal reasons and and so uh, it's worth it so i just i just tell myself just put in the extra work it's worth it in the end you uh you're one of the ones too like when i started really really getting into filming like some of your it's it the videos have to be quite a few years old now but some of your like how you film hunts recommendations are like top notch especially if you're turkey hunting because i i got into turkey hunting later in life and mm -hmm. especially filming turkey hunting i didn't start doing that until a couple of years ago but uh or a few years ago i guess now but um you have some very uh, efficient and unique ways of filming turkey hunts that I have implemented in, in to my uh, arsenal of camera gear and all that kind of stuff. So one day, one day it's going to be easy for everyone to film the hunts. You know, with 360 cameras, you know, becoming yep. more and more prevalent. Um, there, there are times where I thought about just you know, you'll see in some of my videos coming up where I just have a 360 camera mounted right here, and that's my only camera, and and um, and I use my phone to talk to kind of narrate things so it's it's getting easier and easier to self-film oh yeah the technology. the uh the action cams we'll call them or whatever yep. you know they're getting better way better yeah um and i i got one i got a 360 camera this year and i got a gopro on my bow and like you got two angles there that are going to be pretty good for bow hunting now, obviously gun hunting and stuff it's going to be a little tougher but um yep. but yeah it's like it's it's pretty easy to get a shot on film now yeah, I'm, I'm always looking on Amazon each year to see if there's a, a new 8K action camera out. You know, that's yep. my next next step. I'm looking for something that allows me to just put a couple cameras around me and then I'll be able to crop in instead of yep. you know, physically zooming in. Right, right. Yeah, we're getting a little nerdy now on this stuff, so <laughs> we'll quit. <laughs> um, but uh, if you guys have questions for Shane or, or myself, Go ahead and ask them in the uh, question in the in the comment section there on the right side of your screen, and we'll try to get to them tonight. Uh, we're going to talk all about deer tracking and shot placement and broadheads and everything else when it comes to after the shot. And uh, Shane, how long have you been using dogs to track deer now? Yeah, we're going in our into our seventh season, so I've done it for six okay. years. I got you. What I was going to ask you, what made you get into like what what made you decide to get into that? Uh, a buddy of mine I was hunting with, I was filming his hunt. Um, he put a, a bad shot on deer, didn't get much penetration. And I'd already been thinking about that prior to it. Yeah. But that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And, and well, what really broke the camel's back was when we posted on Facebook in Minnesota here looking for people to help us grid search the next day. Because that's the way you looked if you lost blood. There was no blood. Um, and we had volunteers told them where to meet us the next morning zero people showed up and i was like yeah i can't count on anybody <laughs> yeah so uh, i'm gonna get a dog i can count on the dog but he at my my buddy owns his own company he paid one of his employees you know to help us grid search all uh, up until around noon the next day yeah and so um i was like yeah a dog would make this much more efficient and so i went and got a pup uh like a month or two later <laughs> How, how, uh, what's the process like training a dog to scent trail a, a deer after it's been shot? Uh, there's kind of a lot to it, but it's, uh, fairly simple in the big scheme of things. Um, you, first of all, the first steps, 
is you want to make sure they they recognize what the goal is and that's to to follow uh, a trail of a wounded deer or whatever that's what i train my dog for specifically for wounded deer i don't track anything else no bears or anything um the first thing i did was just drag a little piece of beef liver across the yard 40 yards and make you know hit it behind a tree brought the dog out right away pointed to the spot and said find it um come up with a command that your dog knows that you're going to be tracking deer that way when you're walking to the hit site they hear that word like find it or uh hunt it up or whatever you want to use and they know that okay they're working now and so it you don't want to spend a lot of time on like liver drags and hide drags and leg drags and stuff because that's real easy for the dog you just want to see if they understand the concept and then i transition quickly to using a hoof of a deer and you want to get a hold of hooves from deer that were shot and ran away and then were recovered not deer that were shot and dropped in their tracks with like a gun or hit mm -hmm. by a car uh, because those deer release other odors that a dog can key in on that tells them that this is a wounded deer and that comes in handy later because not only do you want them to track a specific deer the dog can indicate whether that deer is mortally wounded or not they'll give up on the track and you know like yep I'm not following this deer anymore it's not mortally wounded mm -hmm. because the deer when it's hit initially it may release those odors but 100 yards 200 yards later it stops and relaxes and it's just a back whack it stops releasing those odors dog gets to that point in the track and it says yep the deer quit uh putting off that odor and they're, they're using the same thing that coyotes use to find your deer that's why coyotes find wounded and dead deer so mm. quick they cut a track of a wounded deer they know the difference between a healthy deer and a wounded deer so concentrate on uh go ahead now because deer season starting tomorrow in some places and saturday and a lot of other places start asking people to save those legs uh I vacuum seal mine uh, together from each individual deer so they don't cross contaminate. Yeah. And I freeze them. And then when we do training tracks, um, I just open up a pair and you can use a broomstick or something and, and hose clamp it to it and just walk it. I don't, I don't recommend, I mean, some people use blood. I was of the mindset of not using blood because there's going to be often times where you don't have blood. Right. And there's going to be like, a few molecules sent molecules of blood on the, the leg you're using to lay the training track and so the, the the dogs when they get real tracks under their belt they're going to learn to associate the blood and lack of blood with the deer they're finding but if you just train on blood when you go out there to track a deer that was shot and it quits bleeding you're going to have a hard time uh locating that deer because the dog was trained just on blood but anyway i can go into a long story about the, the training process but you basically, <laughs> right. you basically want to as you're training make the tracks longer and age them longer make them a little more difficult as long as the dog's progressing in its training just keep doing that and then you're going to introduce other distractions along the way um like take a hide from a another deer lay your training track and age it say eight hours and then right before you bring your dog on it take that hide and drag it across the track at 100 yards or 200 yards and see if they jump track to the hot smell and then you can correct them say no do not follow the hot smell follow the one we mm. own and stay on it so there's a lot of uh aspects of training and uh um, there's plenty of resources online youtube uh, unitedbloodtrackers.org you know you can find uh resources to help you train your dog i grew up a dog hunter like my whole family had types of hounds mostly mm -hmm. uh, be beagle hounds we had walk arounds and all that. So, so like, I'm always real interested about dog, dog stuff. You know, I'd like to get a shed dog sometime. And the, the, the only thing that keeps me from doing what you do is that I love to deer hunt. And it seems like that can kind of, uh, yeah. Kiss your hunting, hunting career. Goodbye. When you start tracking. Uh, yeah. I, and not only does it, there's a chance that you will enjoy it more tracking more that you'll give up hunting. Like some trackers do. Yeah, but it, it will take away a lot of your time. And for me personally, I enjoy tracking, but at the same time, I enjoy deer hunting. But I also have a guilty conscience sometimes if a track comes in and I'm sitting in a deer stand. Yeah, I feel guilty that I have a dog that's capable of finding deer. How would I feel if I needed my deer? Kind? So I'll, a lot of times I'll end my hunt, and go find their deer just because I, I feel bad for them. And I want them to I want them to find their deer. Yeah, I could see that happening for sure. What uh, what breed? does a guy want to use when it comes to dog tracking? Oh man, the, the choices are endless. Uh, oh, are there? 
Yeah, I mean, just about any dog is uh, capable of, of finding deer. I, yeah, that's something you got to research on your own. But uh, I'll I'll tell you kind of the, the selections that I would choose. It it depends on if the dog's going to be a house dog or a family pet as well. Um, you maybe don't want a super huge dog that barks a lot. My dog, my blue tick coonhound, Callie, she's borderline not <laughs> suited to be a, a family <clears throat> that walks by. And so she yeah. wakes up in the middle of the night. Uh, but she's a great tracking dog. And then our Boykin Spaniel, which my daughter wanted um, for a birthday gift a while, a couple of years ago. She wanted to train him and he's, he's got a great nose on him and he's found some deer, but he's very birdie. And so he kind of hops around and does circles and he, we track on lead. And so he'll end up tying the lead and knots around a tree. And then I've got to untangle him. And, uh, he's getting better at it. He knows uh, we did some training tracks this summer and he pretty much uh, did a straight line and did do all the weaving and knot tying. But um, basically decide what works for you and maybe the, the area you're hunting or tracking like, for instance, <clears throat> when I was looking at getting my first tracking dog, I was, I know there's a lot of marshes and wetlands around here. So I wanted a dog a little bit taller, a little bigger so that, that could go through that water. Yeah. As opposed to like some people use the little uh, dogs, wire hair Dotsons, Teckles and things like that. Smaller breeds, um, they don't handle deep cattail marshes as well. Uh, and so there's a lot of factors, but any dog pretty much can be trained to track deer. Just yeah. get one that suits you. That's interesting. Um, let's uh, let's just move on to uh, the the part that most deer hunters care about is the after the shot in their process. Um, what I guess what is the most common issue you see with someone that made a bad shot and they call call you uh, to come track their deer, and what's the mistake most people make? Uh, there's a there's a couple. They track too soon. Um, and then um, they continue tracking after jump bumping the deer. And they, you know, they think, oh, I'll just give it another hour. And then they go out there and track it and bump it again. Um, obviously, you got to assess the situation. Some Sometimes it's invert, inadvertent. You know, they, they think it made a great shot. The deer's slightly dead and they go track it and bump it and, then, and realize, okay, maybe it wasn't as good of a shot. But um, I see that all too often where people think, you know, I can go track it right away. As long as the the weather's permitting, uh, you know, don't be in a hurry. Like I shot a deer, and uh, a buddy was hunting with me. He was a few miles away, and told him I shot one. He said, "You want me to come help you track?" And I said, "Yeah, but don't be in any big hurry. Just go ahead and finish your hunt." And I slowly packed my stuff up and headed to the truck. And it was you know a couple hours later before we even picked up the track. Temperatures were great for it. You know, didn't weren't, I wasn't worried about spoilage, and so. Uh, I wasn't in a big hurry, but also one of the things, I guess the mistake they make is they, you know, they just shot a deer and they're super excited. They get loud they start high five and stuff. Uh, they don't pay attention to the little things after the shot, sit there quietly, listen, uh, see what you can hear as the deer runs off, observe where the deer run off, ran off, uh, mark mentally mark the last spot you saw the deer. All those things uh, don't seem important at the time. But if you end up needing, if the track starts getting difficult, uh, those things are really critical. Yeah. Um, you care if I just give you some like uh, scenarios and maybe just talk about that? Like, um, like your recommendations for someone's like, I shot a deer last year in the liver. I knew his liver hit all day long. Like, what's a guy supposed to do or a girl if you shoot something in the liver? What, what's your, like, as a dog tractor that's been on probably hundreds of tracks now? Um, what's the worst case scenario with a liver hit? Well, worst case is it's going to be alive for quite a while afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. Liver's liver's tricky because you can hit some parts of the liver. I don't know if you've ever cut a liver open, like cross sectioned mm -hmm. it. It um, it doesn't have like blood vessels like you're you know like you're used to or arteries going through the body like you're used to. It has more like little tunnels through it that blood flows through it, and I guess that's a way for it to filter out the um, the bloodstream. But you, there's some big tunnels, you know, like almost the size of my pinky. There's little tunnels are running all through there, and blood's flowing through there. And if your broadhead cuts one of the big ones, that deer can die within minutes. But if you hit another section, maybe miss the tunnels or hit a little one, um, the die it could take longer. And so, depending on where you hit the the deer in the liver, 
can really affect how long before they expire. So it's, it's tricky. Um, if we know it's a liver hit, we, our basic, um, game of, uh, rule of thumb is, um, to give it used to, I used to give them like six to eight hours, but I started coming up on a lot of liver shot deer still alive. And so now mm. more along the lines of giving them at least 10 to 12 hours. I have seen them alive 16 hours later after a liver shot. But I think if you, you go in at 10 to 12 hours, you're pretty safe. Um, there are going to be a few instances where they may still be alive, but uh, if the temperature is an issue, I, I tend to play it on the lower end just because we're trying to recover that deer and hopefully it, it, and not lose any meat. So that's a concern also. Um, but if the, the temperatures are okay for waiting longer by all means wait longer yeah okay what about like let's just keep going let's go farther back what if you hit them just right through the freaking guts like right in front of the hip and you're like gosh dang it yeah that's a standard 12 hour wait um and some some trackers like to wait give it tw 24 hours um okay and so uh, what happens is those uh when you cut open the, the intestines or stomach and and, and whatnot the those toxins or whatever get in the bloodstream and you know i'm not an expert in this i just know the the process it they go septic and it takes them a while to die sometimes and so 12 hours is kind of a rule of thumb and some feel like uh maybe 24 hours i i haven't run into too many that were still alive after 12 hours it seems like either they're dead or they're so weak at that point that it's easy to come put a finishing shot in and they don't run away yeah. So that's kind of my rule of thumb. A, a gut shot is the easiest. I think one of the easiest to recover with a dog uh, for a mm -hmm. hunter. You're not going to have blood trails um, usually. And so you're, if you know, you hit way back, just back out get a dog and you, you have like a 95% or higher odds of recovery with a dog on a gut shot, especially if it's clean, a clean track where you didn't even track it, just back out, get the dog and they'll find it the next morning or you know 12 hours later or whatever the tracker decides he wants to uh at what time he wants to track uh i just curious i guess is, is it because that deer is giving off so much of that uh land that they I, that they're wounded and yeah i think it's a combination of several things you know the the i don't know if the because of the guts uh puts off more molecules of scent that's easy for the dog and and the fact that the deer it hurts and they, they they feel sick and maybe they're putting some more of that stress uh odors and scent molecules that the dogs can pick on that this is a wounded or hurt deer but for whatever reason they they usually don't have a, a hard time i can put my dog a lot of people you know, a lot of trackers they love to jump out of gut shot and gut shot request comes in they're you know they're fighting over it not literally but uh you know they're right. they're eager all the trackers are eager to, eager to go on because it's usually it usually is a clean track because there's no blood for the hunters to track and so they just basically give up without contaminating the track too soon or too much and um and yeah, i can put my dog on a gut shot deer you know 12 hours later and usually she just takes me right to the deer within a couple minutes i mean it's it seems so easy for them now that's not going to be the case every time but there's very high odds of recovery with a, a, a clean gut shot track you got any thoughts on um like you hit something in the shoulder and you don't feel like you got very much penetration um because yeah. you hear <laughs> i rolled my eyes at that and i hate those because uh it's either nothing it either it didn't get into the thoracic cavity or it just got one lung and those are like one of the lowest odds of recovery um because those deer they, they either survive or they just live so long that you're not going to recover them. And especially up here where we had track on lead. Down south, they can uh, run off lead. They can bait up the deer. They can come in and dispatch. So um, yeah. it's a little easier for them. But if if you're tracking a deer that was like, like you described, the best thing is to get on it as soon as possible and uh, just just keep pushing them. And if it, it is indeed a one lung hit, they, they eventually can't supply the the blood uh through the body with enough oxygen if they're continuing out, continually on the move and so that's kind of the rule of thumb there is to, to push a one lung hit deer just keep pushing it and you, you it's not very easy to do that tracking and uh, uh, sight tracking as a hunter yeah. get a dog on there and you can do it more effectively yeah 
How far is a deer run on a one lung though? Oh how man. <laughs> um, I recovered one one time and he, he didn't go terribly far. I, I think about three or 400 yards and we jumped him and then uh, he only made it another 150 yards or so. And he laid right back down. He couldn't get up the second time. Um, but mm -hmm. there's, there's stories of people, you know, like off lead tracking them 10, 10 miles. Um, if you don't track it at all, Odds are that the deer is going to show back up on camera two weeks later, and will it die eventually? Maybe, but those deer, um, there's it's just a low odds of recovery, low odds of mortality, um, at least in the in the short term. Yeah, one lung's tough. Yep, I that's should, it. I <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I a few years back I had that scenario happen to me, and it was like, you know, we yeah, we didn't find it, and it was seemed like he was. Every time he, you, he just seemed to kept going, you know, it's like he never was yeah. going, willing to give up and eventually you just got to give up on him. Yeah. I see the videos often on, on social media and YouTube where the you guy know, sticks an arrow in there and three quarters of the arrow sticking out as he ran off and the comments are all great shot, good shot, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, if you were a tracker, you'd cringe at that because, um, that, that recovery could go either way. It's by mm -hmm. far, I mean, the shot placement may have been okay. But if I don't see the penetration, at least, you know, buried to the fletching or a uh, complete pass through, that would worry me. Yeah. Yep. So let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, shot placement and, and, um, probably a topic that everybody would be disappointed if we didn't talk about as broadheads and the kind of what you mm -hmm. recommend as a dog, dog tracker. Um, what, uh, what are your thoughts on different types of broadheads, whether it be mechanicals or just like a hundred grain fixed blade head versus, you know, uh, something with higher FOC. And I'm sure you've seen it all as a tracker. Yeah. Um, uh, I have mixed thoughts on it, I guess. Um, yeah, I used to kind of be a you know, fixed all the way type of guy. And there, there's pros and cons to each. I, I like the big cutting uh, diameter of mechanicals, what they usually offer but it tends to sacrifice penetration and from our data collection penetration is huge the the more the pass through shots have a much higher odds of recovery with or without a dog it seems like and um or with a dog for sure because our stats show that but without a dog it seems that way as well um you get more pass throughs with a fix but that smaller cutting diameter um seems to cost a little cost you a little bit there's you know it's a balancing act and so i can't i can't these days argue one way or the other um which one is better i personally like fix because i'm not i, I don't want um to not get a pass through the, the few times i didn't get a pass through was um with mechanicals when i tried those out a few several years back whenever back in the early 2000s and um so I, I guess I really don't have an answer either way. I mean, if you, if you're getting pass throughs with a mechanical consistently, by all means, keep shooting. Um, yeah. But um, I'm not going to say change that because that's, that's going to give you great odds of recovery. If you could shoot a fixed head with maybe a little bit bigger cut, that'd be nice. You know, the, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what, you know, we're going to talk about the app later, what the data is going to come in from that and kind of, we have small uh, sample sizes, you know, we have 400, tracks under uh, in our data collection but in the big scheme of things that's a small sample size and right now it shows like pass-throughs are king fixed blades do better at pass-throughs um, mechanicals suffer at pass-throughs but if you don't get a pass-through mechanicals are king you know if yeah. you had you had 10 shots with a fixed no non-pass-through and 10 shots with a mechanical non-pass-through those mechanicals are going to be found more often than the fixed and so there's you know it's a catch 22 right there yeah i think i mean and the internet is uh i would say borderline toxic with this uh topic um yeah. and i think the moral of the story is like they all can not work you know it all yeah. can go south on you if 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 uh for whatever reason like you said a fixed blade doesn't make two holes and if a expandable um you know, if you hit the shoulder with the expandable and it blows up or, you know, just they, they, they all cannot work and they all can work great. Yeah. I, th I think if I had one issue with mechanicals, it's it, it hides problems with the tuning of your bow. Yeah. 
I got a buddy I was just talking to uh, last week, and he wants to shoot fixed, and he cannot get his fixed broadheads to hit where his field points are. And, and he's throwing everything he can at it. He, he can throw a mechanical in there, and it hits right there with it. And I'm like, yeah, but you're masking some issue. Mm. Um, you may be able to hit the deer where you want to, but then that may end up sacrificing penetration. Um, I would be concerned, you know, I would be um, focused on trying to figure out why you can't get your fix to hit where your mechanical, I mean, where your field points hit. Right. And then, and then if you want to shoot mechanicals after that, go ahead. 100%. But there is, there's an issue going on. If you, I mean, there were, we're talking a foot to the right of where his field points are. If you're, yeah. if your bow's in tune and shooting straight, no matter what fix you use, it should, if they're a good quality fix and don't have yeah, good arrow and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's cheap fix broads out there, you know, broadheads that have been, I've seen them with <laughs> bent blades right out of the package and yeah, yeah those are going to fly crooked, but um, so yeah. So make sure your bow is shooting straight. Number one. Yeah. You're going to have a hard time with fixed blades if they're not, I mean, you're, you're going to drive your, pull all your hair out yeah. um, for sure. Um, and another thing is if, if your uh, bow isn't tuned, you're losing a lot of efficiency with your bow mm -hmm. too. You know, that arrow's wasting a lot of energy trying to correct itself in flight. Um, the veins are, and that's, that's not good either. And, that, and then you're going to shoot a mechanical and then have less energy coming into the uh, animal because it's, you're wasting all that energy in the you know first half of the shot with the arrow trying to correct itself. Yep. So it's just or, like a. You know, yeah. Or it hit, hits the deer at a slight angle. I mean, it may not be uh, noticeable to you in live action, but if it hits it at just a slight angle, you yeah. just, it just sapped a lot of penetration out of that arrow. Yeah. I was, uh, I shot mechanicals back in the day, like in the early 2000s, kind of like when you were talking, when, the rage in the cage and all that mm -hmm. stuff was being marketed real heavy, you know, and I kill a lot of deer with them. Um, and then for the last several years, I've shot only fixed blades, you know. Um, but I've always been like, I've always struggled with like some of the blood trails and, you know, just, just little things, you know, never, um, never per se had, uh, real big issues with them. But then like, it, like there's a lot of, really good hunters that kill a lot of deer that shoot mechan or mechanicals and you know their argument is is the accuracy argument and then also um i think today's technology is much better than it was in the early 2000s you know yeah um so I, yeah for sure <laughs> i i just uh i think there's some really good broadheads in on both uh, ends of the spectrum mechanicals and fixed blades now and it's just six to one half dozen the other yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm playing around with the thought to try mechanicals again, just to you know, just yeah. to experiment. But then I know I'm. I'm, I'm probably going to regret it. I'll, as soon as I, it may not even end up being the broadhead's fault. As soon as I lose my first deer with mechanical, I'm gonna blame that head. <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm trying to remain neutral on it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yep. Um. Let's uh. Let's talk about. We got a lot of questions, so let's talk about the app now. You're yeah. part of the new tracker app that uh, you guys just introduced, uh, which you get, it kind of came about what around July ish, July, August timeframe, Shane. August is when um, Android uh, launched. Um, I can't remember. I think it was around earlier, mid August. Heck, heck I can't remember the days yeah. to blend together. Uh, iOS just launched last Friday. Yep. Um, so that that's kind of what we're putting as the official launch date because both of them are available now. Right. Okay. Gotcha. So for, Anybody listening right now that doesn't know what the tracker app is at all, can you kind of give everybody the elevator pitch for it and kind of describe it? Basically, basically it's a one-stop shopping for a, a, a qualified tracker in your area, uh, where before you had to go down a long list of phone numbers and ask friends. You open, you know, you create an account on here as a hunter. It's free. You submit a tracking request, which is, you know, a bunch of questions that a tracker is going to ask you anyway and hit submit. And it goes out to every tracker in the area that um, matches um, the criteria for your track. Say they track deer and you're within 70 miles of their house, if, if that's what they their range is. Um, say there's 10 trackers in that area that match that criteria. A push notification goes to their phone instantly um, and alerting all 10 trackers. Hey, I need help finding this deer. Uh, so you don't have to worry about calling in the middle of the night. You don't have to worry about going down a list of numbers. Uh, just one click and you've 
you find out real within short order whether there's going to be a tracker available for you or not. Whenever you you talked to me about it quite a while ago, about a month ago now probably, and the first thing I thought of was like it's like Uber for dog trackers. Yeah, or for so deer hunters. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard uh, DoorDash. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, I guess it, it's along the same lines, it, except for like, I haven't used Uber personally. I, I know friends that have. I think you can see the Uber drivers on the map though, right? Like, Yeah, you can see at. that. Yeah. Well, you can't see the trackers on the map. Now, the trackers, <laughs> can, the trackers can see where you're, where you're located, where your request came from, because we okay. have a map on our side. But you, uh, the, I mean, there's, a lot of people ask, uh, can I see the trackers in my area? We may add a feature at some point, an improvement to the app that when you hit submit, it tells you how many trackers it went to. Yeah. But for right now, you just hit submit and then you just cross your fingers and hope that somebody's going to reach out to you. Um, but um, there there was we didn't see a need in putting a list in there. I mean, there's already plenty of lists on social media and, and everywhere else. We we did. We don't we want to reinvent that push and we want to do something that's more efficient streamline it yep exactly uh, um do you have any type of like vetting process for the trackers like do they have to have so many tracks under their belt or anything like that it's um this man this has been a tricky uh thing to get through um we want to make sure that when your request goes out it does go to a qualified tracker um hopefully we get you the best of the best you know yeah but it's the, the vetting process varies per state so like here in Minnesota, in order to be part of our deer tracking network, um, you know, we vet our trackers. And so anybody that joins the app from that list, I just hit approve because they're already vetted. Wisconsin's the same. Uh, South Carolina is the same. You know, they had to pass a UBT1 test, um, basically proving their or certifying that their dog is capable of finding wounded deer. Um other states, it's kind of like the wild, wild west, <laughs> you know, Yeah. Um, down south where they don't, you know, they've been using deer for tracking dogs for forever. Um, basically, I've found some of the, the guys down there that already know most of the people down there, the trackers. And so we have a team in different each state down there. And I give them a list of names and locations. Um, they either give me a thumbs up, like, yeah, that, that guy's been doing it for a while. He's got great dogs. I would not hesitate to have him track my own deer or my daughter's deer or whatever. Um, this guy I don't know much about, I'm going to reach out to him. And then, so they'll call him. And if it's a, a maybe an inexperienced tracker, maybe it's their first year, we'll tell them like, go ahead and get some more experience. And, uh, we can add you later if, uh, we see that, you know, you, you're getting there. So it, it varies from each state. Um. Some states, you know, require state license to track. And so I had to confirm those things. So like, like I told you before the show, I've been working almost 15 hour days since iOS launched vetting these trackers. And thankfully I have a huge team across the country that is helping me find out more about each person. We're trying to keep the bad apples off and, yeah. um, and, 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 uh, assure that, when a hunter submits a request, they get a qualified dog, somebody that can. Now, you don't necessarily need to be on these vetted lists sometimes. If if someone reaches out and says, hey, I've been doing it for five years. I just had no interest in joining a, a tracking group in Minnesota. Um, you know, we'll communicate with them. We'll see what their qualifications are, you know, how many recoveries they got. We'll get feedback from as many sources as we can. And if we feel like they're they're good to go, we'll add them to that. Yeah, so that, that makes sense. It's, it's it's a it's kind of an evolving, flowing process. There's no definitive answer I can give you on how to yeah. get vetted, though. Yeah, outside of like the, um, you know, states that maybe whitetails aren't prevalent. Do you guys pretty much have access to every state that would be prevalent uh, on the app? Yeah, the the app is available nationwide. If that's what you're asking. Yeah. Uh, well, I know there's certain states that like tracking is illegal. And, yeah, I mean, and if someone joins from that state, I don't know why they'd want to join. Um, yeah. because, uh, we probably just won't add anybody to that state. Uh, some states have uh, where you can track in certain parts of the state or under certain circumstances. So we have to you know, cross that bridge when we get to it. For the states that it's illegal, I just don't add anybody there. I mean, yeah. there's no sense in adding. Now, they may be located in a state that doesn't allow, but they may track across the border. And so then I'll get clarification. Like, um, I see that 
you you live in this state and that just came up today as a matter of fact i think it was in they, they lived in massachusetts or one of those states over there that doesn't allow it and they lived at the border and they tracked in the neighboring state and so mm. um after some vetting uh from you know some research and stuff i found out yeah they're legit they got a good dog they have a bunch of recoveries and so i had to approve them they just they probably should have put in their profile that you know a town just across the border <laughs> yeah. would have saved me some trouble it uh it seems insane to me that a state would make it illegal to take your dog on a walk on a lead in the woods and, yeah i mean you know and that's that's the, that was the case for minnesota and it wasn't because they made it illegal to track it was because they were trying to protect uh or they were trying to uh eliminate or pre prevent hunting deer with dogs and so when they originally wrote the law they didn't put any thought into tracking deer with dogs and so yeah. they're 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 the way the wording was uh put put into the law it basically banned tracking deer with a dog just because you know how they have the definitions you're you're actively hunting if you're pursuing tracking chasing and, and that yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so as soon as we bring a dog in there on a leash and we're tracking it now we're hunting that deer and so then it, yeah so that was the thing in minnesota we had to have the word wording corrected um, it wasn't that like they were prevent, trying to prevent tracking deer. That makes sense. It's a clerical thing that the yeah. thought about back in yeah. the day. Yeah. Um, app people are asking, I've kind of been eyeing the comments. Is it cost anything to join? If you're, no, it's, it's, it's totally free to download and, and to submit a tracking request on the hunter side. It's totally free for the tracker. You know, there's no cost at all to use yeah. it to take to accept tracks. On the hunter's side, it's free to download and submit a tracking request. Now, we if we find you a tracker, say three of them offer their services, you can look at each tracker's profile, their rates, their experience, and then you choose one. At that point, when you choose one, then we charge you a ten dollar finder's fee. Okay, and so and it's kind of at the discretion of the of the uh, tracker how much he's charging to come out. Yeah, there. The, the, the fees for the tracker you you pay them separate. Um, gotcha. Like if they charge a hundred bucks to come track, uh, you're going to pay the $10 finders fee and then you're going to give your tracker a hundred dollars. Or if they work on tips, you're going to tip them, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, so don't punish your tracker and take $10 off his tip just because you had to pay $10 for the finder fee. Yeah. Um, and trust me, we, we wish we didn't have to charge a finders fee, but we, this, the app costs a lot of money to build and maintain. And for now, that's how we're trying to cover in our expenses expenses and uh, if we can do away with that at some point we will but uh, just uh yeah i think it's well worth ten dollars to find you a, a reputable tracker i was i was just get, getting ready to say shane the that ten dollar fee is well worth the the hassle that it uh takes away by having everything in one location and um, yeah and, and and know you're getting a quality tracker and not just some random dude's name off of facebook and he have, may have a porch dog or something and yeah and it, yeah that was free but it just cost you a hundred dollar tracking fee for a dog to go run around and sniff his butt and instead of trying to find your deer right right um before we get into the questions is there well first of all is there anything else with the app you want to talk about did I, or did i ask you all the right questions I mean, that's the, the app in a nutshell. I mean, there's a lot of features that trackers are going to enjoy. I don't know how many are going to be tuning in right now, but um, there's a lot of things that make our life much easier. I mean, we can, at a glance, we can see a map and see what all the tracks are available, the animal, all the details about the track without talking to the hunter. Um, you can kind of make your assertion or decision on the fly, whether you, you're going to take that track or not. I mean, you look at a glance and you see it's a gut shot and I got to work tomorrow morning, so I'm not available. So I don't even, um, I don't even need to entertain the thought of taking that one. Mm -hmm. Or you could tell your buddy, say, Hey, I've got this track on the tracker app. Here's the hunter's contact. Maybe give him a call. You know, um, I'm sure there's going to be some of that where the tracks come through the app and then they're taken off the app without actually completing through it. Um, yeah we we could do something to prevent that but right now we our goal is to connect hunters and trackers and so we'll just let those things slide for now but um just just remember <laughs> without the finder's fee coming in eventually we're going to run out of money and we're going to shut it down if we can't uh, yeah pay for the app to maintain it well i mean it's like in everything else like you gotta it has to be worth it on your end they're like why yeah. what's the point you know yeah um 
growing pains right now. Yep. How, how uh, user friendliness of the app? Like, what is like? I go down on the app. Like, can you kind of walk us through the process of of what that looks like? Of okay, I, I hit a deer back. I'm gonna get on that tracker app and start the process. So there's two two routes you can do as a hunter. Uh, number one, you create a, an account and log in. Um, there's no approval process on the hunter side of things. As soon as you create an account, you're in. Um, the first thing you can do is create a weapon toolbox or add a weapon to your toolbox. Um, be a bow, a firearm, whatever. You don't have to do that. But for our data collection, which people are going to really want to see when we launch that uh, analytics page later on, the more information you can put in as far as the weapon, the type of arrow, you know, the weight of the arrow, the broadhead, and et cetera, the firearm, the caliber, go ahead and create your weapon, you know, and, and they ask you a lot about it, like your draw weight for a bow, for instance, the draw weight, um, the arrow weight, broadhead, brand, model, et cetera, lighted knock. And then you save that and, it's, and it becomes a preset, basically. So uh, you need a tracker, you hit request tracker button. So the first thing I asked you is, what did you shoot? You know, when did you shoot it? What type of property? Was it public or private land? Um, it's going to ask you what you shot it with. And if you have a weapon in your toolbox, you just select one of the presets and it automatically fills everything out because you've already saved it. If you don't want to go through the time of doing that, um, later in the questionnaire, it's going to ask you, what did you shoot it with? What type of weapon? A bow, crossbow, firearm. Um, so you, you don't have to do the toolbox part. Uh, but it's going to go through your standard questions that a tracker is going to ask you. What was the deer's reaction? Where did you hit it on the deer? And there's a little grid for you to pick, you know, the coordinates. Uh, was it a pass through or not? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end, if you have video of the shot or if you have pictures of the blood trail, you can attach those and you hit submit. And that's pretty much it for the hunter. Um, as far as other features on there, the, the analytics page will be coming at some point, maybe during deer season, where all the tracks that come in through the app, you'll be able to filter through. And, and like I post data on social media every year of our tracks and like the pass through rates and recovery rates, you'll actually be able to alter and filter it to your liking. Like, I don't care about the passives. I want to see this data point. And so you'll be able to do all that uh, from the data that's coming in. Um, and so that's it for the hunter side, basically. It's a pretty straightforward. Go ahead, if you're going to be in an area with weak service, go ahead and be logged into the account and just close it out and leave it, you know, running in the background. It doesn't, It's and it's small too. I mean, like some apps, you know, 400 megabytes download, this one's like 20. Yeah. So it's, it's not very, a very big file. On the tracker side of things, you uh, basically sign in and your name and, and uh, you fill out a few things about it and hit submit and it'll, a little thing will pop up and says, waiting um admin approval and so i get a notification on my end someone signed up i have all the information about them i can see all their their stuff on my side i can't see your password but i can see everything else and uh then the vetting process that i described earlier proceeds and then then i will approve them or reject them you won't get notified of that you just have to try and log in you know every so often we could have built that in to be notified, but that adds more expense. And so whenever we yeah. cut costs, we did. So I've, I've gotten a lot of emails. Hey, when will I know I'm approved? And I look, I'm like, you, you were approved yesterday. <laughs> I just yeah. log in. But once you're approved, you log in and then you can go in there and you, you can edit more details about yourself. You know, your range, uh, the animals, the, ser the animals you track, elk, moose, bear, deer, uh, turkey, coyotes, whatever. And then, um, and then you just wait for, you know, you can upload a profile picture and then you just wait for tracks to roll in. And then you can keep doing the old fashioned way of having people call you direct. Um, but this is going to be another resource for you to have in your pocket. And um, eventually I think it'll it'll take over because the tracker is going to see how much efficient this is. Yep. It's a great idea, Shane. And um, I guess the four guys was it was you, Garrett. uh Greg and there was another guy that I Ryan, didn't Ryan Carpenter. Right. So yeah, so Greg and I, uh, uh, you know, this is an idea I've had for several years, and I approached Greg Goffrey. Um, Greg's got yeah. the money, you know. Yeah. If you guys don't know who Greg, <laughs> that that he's he owns Tethered. Yeah. Saddle company. One, yeah, one of the co-owners of Tethered. Co so yep. he and I talked about building this app uh, a few years ago, and and 
the developer we were talking to at the time it just it was way too expensive and so we kind of put it to the to the side and then i went through another tracking season i called him up like dude we got to do something this is this is right and so um ryan carpenter actually heard me on a podcast talking about tracking years ago and i was looking for someone to help work on my dad and he called he lives you know five miles from me and he called me up or emailed me and said hey man i'd be willing to work on it and so we became friends we've been hunting together um so he was uh one I approached also wanted to go into it. And then Garrett Prawl, I've known for years since I moved to Minnesota, I found his YouTube channel. We've hunted a lot together. And so, uh, four friends, I, you know, we went in together and, and so here we are. And I, yeah. I think, I think it's a great combination. You have the business know-how of Greg Godfrey. You have the analytical brain power of uh, Garrett and uh, Ryan Carpenter, and then you mm -hmm. have a tracker. And so yeah. uh, I think it makes a great team. Yep. Seems like a good group to, to build something together. So congrats. I think it's a good idea. It'll be successful for sure. So thank you. I hope everybody, so. <laughs> it, the, it's the, the link to the website for tracker is, uh, is on the, in the description below. So you guys can go there and check it out online, but then you can go to your app store or your play store on your Android device or Apple device and download. And it's like tracker, like there's no ER at the end. It's just the R. So, yeah, T, T, there's no C in it either. It's T R A A R. And the website is Get Tracker, G E T T R A K R dot com. Yep. So go check that out. Hmm. Download it before deer season because you may need it. You just have it on there and just in case. Yeah, and, and just have it because at some point you're going to get an update and it says the analytics page is ready for your use. And, and yeah, it'd be it. super interesting. Yeah. Maybe once that happens after season, we can have you on. We can talk about it. Yeah. That'd be cool. Um, before we get to questions, you got uh, you got your first Nebraska video up just a little bit ago. You were in you were in the same area Dan and then we're at. No, Dan was in the same area where I was at. There you go. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. you Actually, were there he, first. Yeah, <laughs> I was there like a week before everybody out there glassing because yeah. my work schedule allows for me to you know to get out there a little earlier. Yeah, and um, he was actually not hunting right near us. I think he uh, he ended up closer to us at some point and. Um, I'm not going to talk much about his uh, hunt out there. I guess. Yeah, he didn't want to talk about it yet. Wait till the videos come out. Yeah, and so um, yeah, I was. I don't know if the population is up this year or not, but I was finding more deer this year than I have in the past. Um, so that was a good thing. It was a hot one though, too. <laughs> yeah, it was hot. 100, like a hundred degrees every day, and I tell you what, I did this year because um, I'm so far away from civilization when you're out in some of these remote areas. You know, in years past, I don't have a big, uh, I hope, can you hear those dogs barking? It's all right, though, Shane, don't worry <laughs> about it. Uh, I don't have a fancy Yeti cooler to keep my ice good for days. I just have a little cheap one. So this year, I was like, you know what? I'm tired of running to the store every couple of days, burn up a lot of fuel and time. This year, I took everything that was non-perishable, foods that um, that I could eat without worrying about refrigeration or keeping cold. I drank, I took seven gallons of water and I took a, a tote full of canned soup and I took a loaf of bread and little mayonnaise packets. You know, you yeah. order those on Amazon and I, and I took um, like canned luncheon meat or the little packs you can open up or, uh, with uh, barbecue, pork barbecue, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, know exactly what you're about. I made do is actually it worked out and it was actually much cheaper. I think I spent $50, $54, on 11 days worth of food yep and so i i, I ate well i guess uh, i think yeah. i may have actually gained a pound or two while i was out there even you, though uh, I was hunting hard you can't, you can't eat on much less than that in 11 days yeah yeah i don't know anybody can do better than that <laughs> and no oh i did um, i did splur splurge a little bit i had me some oatmeal cream pies that was my dessert yeah. today. <laughs> there's where that uh those pounds got put on <laughs> yeah um yeah, Nebraska. Well, I shouldn't say much either yet, but because our video hasn't came out yet, but uh, I was in a different area than you guys, quite a quite a ways away, and it was quite the opposite. Got had some rumors that EHD hit that area real bad, um, and that was one of the reasons they lowered the tag numbers. And I, you know, that's all kind of hearsay stuff. But anyway. Yeah, I think the tag number permit numbers were reduced statewide, just in general, because of the the number of non-residents had increased yeah a lot of complaints from the residents yeah that's got to um, be a, 
I mean, that just seems like more of a gun season problem than a bow season because I, I, I mean, agree. I, I don't think the bow hunters are that big of a threat, non-resident ones, because I, I don't see many hunters out there. Yeah. Now, maybe they show up during the rut or something, but. Right. At least not uh, at first week when it's 100 degrees. Nobody else yeah. is stupid. They're not to as go stupid. Out there. Yeah, they're not yeah. as stupid as us. <laughs> you were using a longbow out there, right? Or your recurve? Yeah, I, I did that for the first couple of days. Um, I, I don't hunt elevated with the recurve. It just doesn't mm -hmm. feel natural. And it does, it, to me, this is just a personal thing. Traditional equipment is a ground game. It's not mm -hmm. an elevated. If I'm going to hunt from a tree, I'm going to just hunt with a compound. And so I did, I did, my goal was to get one with a recurve and hunt almost exclusively, exclusively with it. But there was, instances that i knew i'd be elevated and i took my compound and that that ended up being um what i ended up transitioning to i finished out my last couple of days there with the compound just because the areas i wanted to hunt i wanted to be elevated just to not only hunt but learn be able to observe at the same time it's hard to observe when you're down in the brush you know yeah. you're basically stuck to just that one spot yep um it's tough shooting a uh, traditional bow out of a tree a lot of times too, like the their sight picture so different up there. Yeah, and and I think that's probably why I did that. The first time I uh, hunted from a uh, from a tree with my recurve, I did not like it one bit, and that was the yeah. last time I got elevated with my recurve. I was up in North Dakota uh, that year, and I was like, "This is a big mistake." <laughs> and so, yeah, you won't see me in a tree with a recurve again. Maybe I'm, I might get, you know, a couple of feet off the ground. I've thought about carrying my platform and then just like, if I need to see over some brush, hook it to a tree and just stand on it. But you're still at that point. You're like standing in your yard practicing. I mean, it's going to feel fairly. Uh, right. Similar. You have problems shooting out of the saddle with that thing with your longbow or your recurve. No, it wasn't that. It's just being, I guess, because I practice so much with my recurve from the ground. I practice laying in yeah. the prone position. I lay, uh, practice sitting on one knee, sitting flat on my mm -hmm. butt, because there's going to be instances where that may come in handy. And I actually shot my first deer with it sitting flat on my butt like I'm turkey hunting mm -hmm. um, with my recurve. And then when I get elevated, it's like you said, the sight picture, even though I'm shooting they say it's not instinctive it's intuitive it's like you when you throw a baseball you just look where you want to throw it and you don't think about it i that's the way i shoot but it feels weird when you're elevated and i feel mm -hmm. i don't feel like i can hit what i want to you know or i can't throw the baseball to where i want to hit you know mm -hmm. um the, on the ground even like in the prone position which doesn't give you that depth of you know mm -hmm. a feel I'm pre pretty accurate, even just laying on my belly yeah. on the ground shooting a recurve. I can actually have practice where you just hold the, the recurve horizontal and just pull it like that and just from down at belly height and I yeah. can hit the target pretty good. So yeah. there may be an instance where I get caught off guard and a buck comes walking in. I can't come up and do this. I can just pull back and shoot. Yep. I think that's how uh, I like to get Jared Scheffler on sometime because he, dude, that guy, yeah. he practices in all kinds of crazy scenarios and ways and yeah we um, had a he and i had a long talk um a couple of years ago he was in wisconsin hunting with thp and i was in camp with those guys and we we sit around the fire at night talking about shooting traditional equipment um i have my thoughts on it too and and, and i had a lot of questions for him because i i wanted to know what he was using for a quiver i hate quivers being mounted to the side of a traditional boat mm -hmm. i like the simplicity of a stick and string and as close to that as possible um, I have, I haven't really found a hip quiver. Well, I bought a, a quickie quiver, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the old school ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they have a, a hip type one that you can position. And so far that thing's working out pretty sweet and you can detach it without undoing your belt. You can just mm. push a button. It off. You can swivel it. If you're crawling on your hands and knees, you don't want the arrows sticking way up behind you it's like that. Yeah. So you can pivot it back. So it's level when you stand mm. up. So it's working out pretty good, but anyway, yep. Uh, we could go down a big rabbit hole yeah. with tr traditional gear with me at least. Um, yeah, Jared, me and Jared had the same conversation at a show one evening. Like we just got into it and he, yeah, he, he is a, uh, he has a unique mind for it. He's really uh, doing some crazy things with that. Yeah. I, um, I got, I told him he needs to get his arrow flight too. <laughs> Cause I keep thinking about that big Kansas Bucky shot. Oh, that, look. That arrow. I, like, yeah, just, I, know, I know exactly what you're talking he about. He said, yeah, I'm getting that. I'm going to get that corrected. So I, well, I'm, he like, he, he does so many different like 
I don't know how he's consistent with it, like the way he shoots. But I mean, he it obviously. Well, I mean, think he, he about does it. Good job though. You so. Think about it. If I gave you a baseball and said toss it to me, throw it to me, you know, flick it behind your back, you don't need to think about that. You know, you can yeah. be pretty accurate. And that's yeah. what he's done. He's done it so much that it's become an extension of his body. He doesn't need yep. to worry about different odd angles. Yep. Um, and that's my goal. I mean, I, I, all, I'm all for people wanting to get in a traditional shooting, but the, the my kind of my mindset is people get out there and they just shoot like this and they use the tip of the arrow to aim and stuff. And, and me personally, at that point, I'm going to just shoot a compound if I'm going to use a reference. I want this thing to give me a huge advantage. I'm already sacrificing yeah. distance. So I want to be able to, you know, snap shoot. I want to just come up and shoot. You know, I want to yeah. take advantage of those uh, aspects. Uh, my buddy, I'll tell you a story. Then we'll we'll get to the questions, everybody. But uh, my buddy Alan, he's been hunting with a longbow. He never never went to a compound. Like he's an older guy now, and he's always used uh, a longbow or a recurve. And we got invited to go turkey hunting with the guys from the Push. Have you heard of those guys? Mm-hmm. Yep. And of course, at camp they had like a three D target range set up. And Alan's old school, like old school longbow. And I mean, he snap shoots or whatever you want to call it. And, um, you know, they're all sitting there with like, you know, sitting there holding for, you know, 10 seconds. And then, you know, they all have these kind of their traditional bows, but they're metal and all that stuff. He was just sitting in a lawn chair watching everybody. And I sat down there by him and I was like, "Uh, what do you think of all this, Alan? He's like, they're going to aim with that thing. They might as well just go grab a compound and shoot it at them at targets. And I'm like, yeah, I think people want to be able to, um, not all, but I think some people just want to shoot a deer with a recurve without actually learning or putting in the work to, yeah, to, to shoot it in, uh, like a more instinctive style. And so when they get that deer, they can say, yeah, I shot this with this one with a longbow. I shot it with a recurve without any other details. You know, you don't need to give anybody details, but I think you're, you're kind of cutting yourself short on the accomplishment. Get out there and get that quiver off there. Get the sights off there. Just do it uh, the way I, I guess it's just my opinion now. So yeah, don't, right. don't come at me. Um, but it's just the way I think it is intended to be hunted with. Yeah. Freedom, get that freedom. I would, I would agree with you. And I've, I went down the rabbit hole of like some of that stuff uh, with aiming and stuff. And I always just like, forget this. This is, I don't like it. It's like, it's like, I don't, I don't shoot any better for one. Cause I, I psych myself out or something. Too and much I to just, think about in the heat yeah. of the moment. And dude, if I just, I just sit there and if I just let my, cause I'm, I'm fairly hand-eye coordinated person anyway. And if I could just, if I just focus on that and just practice. I'm way better off. It's, it's like for me, I don't need a whole, I don't want a whole lot of thought process into shooting a deer. I, I practice with my yeah. compound and I was, I was out there practicing with my, my buddy, Ryan Carpenter, one of the uh, co-founders mm-hmm. of tracker. And, and I was shooting at the target and he said, do you use your sight bubble? And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, your sight bubble. I said, man, I've never looked at that thing in my life. <laughs> yeah. he, said, he said, look at it when you shoot the next time to make sure your bow is level. I was like, I'm not going to be looking at the thing when I'm shooting at a deer. Well, I want to be looking at it when I'm shooting at a target, you know? Um, and that, that's just one more thing that I'm trying to, as it is, I'm trying to put my peep and center it. So the circles match and mm-hmm. then look at my pin. And last thing I want to do is now look at a, a, a bubble level and mm-hmm. then, you know, and then go measure this and that. I was like, there's, I got a task at hand right now. Yeah. That's putting the arrow. I, yeah. Ideally you want your bow, uh, balanced enough where you don't have to look at it, it just yeah. naturally is level but yeah i don't know if you can see it but i keep my longbow sitting right there and it's in my office and i i got a target right out the window here and i sh- try to shoot it all the time like you just lift it, the window up and shoot it out the window yeah, no i don't do that i <laughs> step out the door here but uh yep it takes a lot of a lot of practice it's it's a commitment if you want to try to shoot something with a, a traditional bow uh, but I, i'd recommend people try it if at least just pick one up and shoot it. You don't necessarily have to hunt it with it. It's a good time. Yeah. It's All fun, right. Let's, it? It's just fun to shoot. Yeah. Oh yeah. Let's talk about some, uh, let's, let's answer some questions, Shane, and I'll let you go. I know you've, you're a busy man. So, uh, George asked, do you, Shane, have you done any testing on percent of recoveries from hunters that sharpen their broadheads versus, versus haven't? No, I have not. And, and we, we hear that all the time. A good sharpen, a good sharp broadhead. It's, uh, improves lethality um and uh, i've heard instances of <clears throat> dull heads pushing organs out of the way and you know so yeah. but 
I don't know. Is there an easy way to do that? Carry one of those little wire gauges that they, you know, yeah. less archery and then Garrett for all has one. You put your blade on it. So maybe when I show up to the track, carry one of those around <laughs> and yeah. uh, test the sharpness of the broadhead, one on the quiver and one that's been gone through the deer. Right. Oleg, he asked, uh, have you recorded the training? Have you recorded the training of the dog videos before, or can you recommend some of the trainers out there on YouTube? Oh gosh. Uh, I have a couple little small ones that really doesn't go into a whole lot of detail. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, Michigan tracker, Brian Alberta. He has a YouTube. I don't know if it's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. I, I need to, I guess, go through YouTube and, and stuff and find a lot of these videos and put it in the playlist and add it to my channel. You know, the, the videos won't be on my channel actually, yeah. but I'll be able to share the playlist because there are some out there, but they're scattered here and there. I don't know if anybody, maybe somebody can comment. Uh, I don't know of one great resource with a, a bunch of just uh, training yeah. for uh, for specifically for tracking wounded uh, big game. It'd be a cool thing to add to the app, or you could like go to a tab on the app and have yeah. information. Baby, like baby, that. baby steps, man, baby steps. We I know, got, I know. We got a long yeah. list of features, yeah. <laughs> and that we want to add, and just trust us that um, we had to get through this launch, and then slowly but surely. You know, yep. You're gonna see different things pop up and say, "Oh, here's a link for this, and here's this feature." But Mark asks, "Is it better to train a young pup, or can you teach an old dog new tricks?" I think it's always easier to train a pup, you know, to establish, you know, before they learn bad habits. But um, from I got a buddy that's a, a trainer. Um, he, you can pretty much train any dog, um, so you can teach an old dog new tricks. But me personally, I, I prefer the ease of training a, a young dog, um, you know, before they learn bad habits. Nolan asked, and I'm going to butcher this, man, but are you familiar with Navad? It's more of a bird hunting based. It's um, interesting. Yes, yeah, a, a, some type of test. Uh, oh. I, I'm not very familiar with it. I've heard of it. Um, so I can't really speak much of it. Yeah. I've never heard of it. I couldn't even pronounce it. So uh, Pharrell asked, how does water or water depth of water or water flow challenge the tracking process? Um, if we had to cross deep water, a lot of times there's scent floating on the water. Um, an, an example, uh, like I, I think I've just explained early in the podcast or either before we started, where's where my track, uh, my blue tick, we had to go through deep, waist deep water. She was swimming. And she was sitting on top of the water, and, and I think there was some blood floating on it. There was there's there was a lot of scent on the water, and she was able to track across that water. Um, it, if you're talking about rain and whatnot, rain is uh, sometimes a good thing for scenting track uh, scent tracking. It helps the dogs. Too much of a uh, rain can be a bad thing, and but it has to usually be quite a bit. I mean, like a der torrential downpour for hours before it, it ruins the scent trail. But moisture is always good for tracking dogs, which, you know, people always ask about trail cameras, checking their trail camera, when's a good time to do it. And I'm, I'm always telling them, do it when it's as dry as possible because dry, dry conditions are terrible scent conditions. Yeah. Uh, George had an, another uh, question here. He said, heard you say that big bucks can do a zombie walk during the rut, even when fatally hit. You tend to give it longer before tracking, or assume the search area is bigger. I think he's, you know, during the rut. Yeah, we we tend to extend our uh, wait times for rut bucks, rutted up bucks. Those don't seem to be an issue, no matter you know what time of the year. But um, man, I've I've tracked bucks that were shot in September. You know, pretty straightforward, pretty standard. You know, three hundred yards later, we find it. Same type of injury on a buck during the or more severe injury for instance a buck we tracked that was shot both lungs uh and lacerated the heart it didn't get into the, the chamber of the heart but it put a deep cut through it and that deer went um approaching a mile oh know? my gosh uh and uh, we found it dead and so i mean they i mean the the deer i shot on video i have on video the one i shot with the target in his antlers mm-hmm that was double lung and right through the heart. I mean, through the chambers and it lived a minute and 37 seconds after I shot it. 
I cut that out of the video of it just standing there just because the viewers didn't need to see it stand there for that long. Plus, it makes for a longer video. But yeah, I was like, did I even hit this deer? What's going on? He just stood there. I mean, and that's just like what your, uh, he described, the zombie bucks. Mm -hmm. They're just a tough critter. Here's a good shot placement we didn't cover, Shane. How do you feel about frontal shots with the bow off the ground? Uh, I don't really care for frontal shots uh, one way or another. Um, I know we've talked with THP and Zach. I know Zach uh, with the hunting public, he likes frontal shots. Garrett Prawl, he will take frontal shots. I have I just haven't seen much good come from them. Uh, we did discuss where on the ground it might be a different story because you, you're having different angles. You know, like from elevated with the shape of the chest cavity, you may get that angle where it can slip off the chest cavity a little easier coming from a downward angle whereas a, on the ground level with the animal ground shots typically are closer and so that may help a little bit but i'm not going to give a frontal shot a thumbs up just from my experience tracking them and and uh i've you know i've taken frontal shots throughout my life at some point i don't do it anymore just because i never had good, good results with it all right Oleg had another question. He says, any dogs you and mixed breeds like labs and poodles? Uh, I can't speak of mixed breeds. Um, me personally, I'm looking at maybe getting me like a mountain cur at one point, at some point. If, if some, Cali, yeah. Let's create some squirrels in the day and track dogs at yeah. night. <laughs> when Cali, when Cali retires, I, I kind of like in the, the, the smaller breeds now, like since I've got the Boykin Spaniel. He's just a great uh, family pet, and uh, he's a lot easier to manage. When you're tracking on lead, that's going to be your factor right there. Are you tracking on lead, off lead, or a combination of the two? If you're tracking on lead at any point, you want a dog you can handle. Because Callie, her first uh, couple of years, just drug me through the woods. She still drags me through the woods. Whereas Jasper, he's a smaller breed dog, and you know he can't pull me uh, like Callie can. So it makes it a little more enjoyable to the track i want a dog like my buddy al sherman of wisconsin i can't remember the breed he has but the dog is just a good tracker and he's like slow and methodical and it looks like al is just taking a sunday stroll behind him as he's tracking whereas i'm being yeah through the woods so <laughs> take get take those factors uh, uh keep those factors in mind when you're picking a dog one that's not going to drag you through the woods whether you're tracking on lead or off and uh, uh yeah some there's some other factors but it's going to be yeah. a personal decision, ultimately. I'm well familiar with getting drugged around <laughs> the woods with my walker hounds and English hounds and things like that. Um, Zeke, if Zeke shoots a 400-pound slob in Wisconsin this weekend, you're going to help drag it, or do I got to get Jacob to carry it? Uh, I'll, call, find call Jacob. You. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find the deer for you, but it, you're on your own after that, unless yeah. you're unless you're a kid or an elderly person or something like that, sometimes I'll stick around to help get those deer in the woods. But if you're, you're if you're capable and you got friends, I'm on to the next track. Now, yep. I'll, I'll, I'll add a little caveat to that. If it's like early part of the season, it's slow. I don't mind sticking around and becoming part of the hunt, help gutting it. You know, I'm, I usually stick around for the field dress and just get photos of the organs. Um, and then I may drag a hundred yards or so and then let you do the rest. Yeah. A lot of people were asking about price, Shane. What is like a like what 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 would you expect to pay a guy that found your deer for you? Um, it's going to vary. Purposes. Yeah, it's going to vary across the country. Minnesota, we're almost all tip based. All our trackers, Wisconsin's a lot of tip based trackers. Some of them charge. Um, so you're looking at from what I've seen, the average rate for a a, a tracker that charges ranges anywhere from a hundred to two hundred fifty dollars, three hundred dollars for a tip based tracker. 50 to hundred dollar tip depending on how far they drove how much work they put into it it's except you know i i shouldn't say acceptable it's um it's acceptable to me but um <laughs> that's yeah. quite that's quite common you know 50 to 100 bucks i've gotten more than that um it, depending on i guess if your financial situation doesn't allow you to tip very much don't let that be a decision whether you hire a dog or not we're out there to we want to find your deer even if it means we got not we get nothing from you give you know throw, throw me a beer i'll be happy yeah I'll drink yeah. it after I get home. Right. That's a, uh, that's, it's good to know. Cause I know that's something, uh, that people don't like to talk about, but it's like, it is part of it, you know, and people, people yeah. want to be fair to everybody. But we, don't guess, want, 
we don't want the man getting in our pocket. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to pay yep. taxes on that. Let's see here. I don't make anything tracking. Just yeah. for the record. I take right. zero dollars in each year. <laughs> Well, by the time you figure gas and dog food oh, yeah. and, and oh, that, there's many know. days that I spend a hundred dollars in fuel and food and stuff, and then I probably made a hundred dollars in tips tracking. So I get home after tracking for ten or twelve hours, and yep. girlfriend's like, "How much money did you make?" I was like, "Uh, zero. <laughs> I broke even." <laughs> your time, your time investment into all this, you know, that's yeah. obviously you got you got to start charging more. No, nope. yeah, I mean, I don't exactly. charge. I don't charge to go deer hunting, and I enjoy it like I'm deer hunting. Right. Truth be told. Uh, Zach asks, are there dog tracking clubs or groups that can help train your dog? How do you find a place to get your dog tested? I'm, I'm, he lives in, uh, Watertown, Wisconsin. Yeah. In Wisconsin, they have the, the Wisconsin deer tracking network. Um, they're on Facebook, reach out to the admins there. Uh, actually one of the admins is, or one of the, I don't know if he's an admin or not, but he's, uh, he's an actual tracking dog trainer. One of the best in the country, in my opinion um he can steer you in the right direction as far as uh training and whatnot uh but the group as a whole will help you get um you know started in tracking get you tested they have testing events we have testing events here in minnesota look for a uh, a state organized group um and they can help um you know the ubt is the the national organization that has the judges and does the testing but these state local organized groups um work with the ubt and put on the events, you know, and have their judges come out. So I would find a, like Minnesota tracking dogs in Minnesota, Wisconsin deer tracking network down South. There's a lot of, uh, say Ar Arkansas blood trailing network, South Carolina tracking dogs. Just look for them on Facebook and then go from there. Shane, that's the end of our questions. Um, thanks for getting on here, man. Talking about all this. I think it's a good topic to talk about right before deer season starts, makes the guy think before, um, yeah. You jump to conclusions after a shot. Um, go over to Shane's channel. I linked it below. He just put a video up about Nebraska uh, today. So yeah, make sure you go over there and give him a subscribe and check it out. We uh, So naturally, we were in Nebraska and, and uh, at our Airbnb. We were staying at all staying at. Airbnb? Man, I slept yeah. in my truck for 11 days. I know. We had we had <laughs> five guys to split it, though. So it, oh, was, yeah. it, it, was, it was practical. Um, I chose my, my life. My life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were trying to find Nebraska stuff, and well, we ended up. Uh, of course, you have a, a a few Nebraska hunts on your channel, man. We just we were just been watching. My dad was just sitting there binge, wa binge watching your your YouTube channel, and everybody was like, "One thing you guarantee is like you seem to always shoot something, whether it be a doe or a uh, a buck. You seem to always have a a kill under your belt on on one of those shows. So we yeah. were enjoying it." Yeah, I know. I know. I watched Dan's uh, first video. You know, I, I talked to him when he was out in Nebraska, and uh, I didn't know he he'd been watching my videos until I watched his his video that launched, and uh, and he admitted in there he'd been watching my yeah. videos to try to get some insight. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So cool. So, However, I get the views, I guess. <laughs> yep. Yep. And then uh, go over and check out the tracker. Uh, app. It sounds like you guys have a lot of social media stuff going on with Tracker too. You yeah, we have uh, not enough on there as as I would like because um, you know all of us are busy. But I'm trying to put some stuff on. We have a TikTok account, a YouTube account. Um, did I say YouTube already? Yeah, Facebook, yeah. In Instagram. Those those four main uh, platforms for Tracker. Um, so, yep. All right, everybody. We'll be lo be looking for probably a show tomorrow night, or we'll we'll be in Wisconsin deer camping up there. So we'll we'll probably throw throw on a uh, deer camp show. Is that, so the, is that next uh, the next stop on the Battle of the Bow? No, this is just uh, Josh going up to Wisconsin with some buddies. <laughs> no, no Battle of the Bow this time. Just a good luck um, up there. Um, thanks. If you need a tracking dog. You know the app to use, right? Yep, that's <laughs> that's for sure. Hope I don't. Hopefully, I well, I hope. Hopefully I'll make a, a good shot and it falls over right there, but, uh, yeah, I'll definitely, yeah. I'll definitely use it if, uh, it need be. Yeah. Um, all right, everybody have a good night. We'll talk to you, uh, this weekend.